Okay, hi everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Um, or, uh, welcome back to the 215 session, I should say. Um, thank you for joining us. Hopefully you're in the right place. This is web room two, where we're going to be debuting um, three new MACERC research projects. Um, whether this is your first showcase or you have been attended many before, um, Jess, Shemek, and Mike should be familiar names to you by now. Um, and the exciting thing about their work is that these are all continuation projects. And um, MACERC funds research on two-year cycles. And a lot of times those projects can yield important new insights that might lead to um, spin-off projects or, or insights that require another, another couple years of research. And these projects all kind of fit that category. So if you've caught any of their presentations before, this will be familiar, but they're all taking the project to the next stage or a possibly new direction. So I will turn it over to Jess uh, in just a minute. Um, if you do have questions, um, just use the Q&A function, please. And if you're not seeing that, just hover your cursor down into the bottom of your Zoom window. You should see a Q&A button. You can type that in at any point and um, we'll get to the questions at the end. Hopefully there's time for everybody. So. I'll turn it over to Jess. Thank you. Um, hi, all. So I just finished giving a full presentation um, on this project, and I did mention the continuation um, part of this project in the last um, the last session. So I apologize if there's some repeats here, but this gives you a chance to ask some additional questions um, if you if you still have some about our um, project. So I'm presenting a continuation project. Um, and this project is really dealing with um, the challenge of mapping and quantifying zebra mussel beds. So if you're looking at a water body, where are the zebra mussels? How many are there? And how do their populations change over time? And these can be difficult questions to answer with tools that are either very um, labor intensive, such as scuba diving surveys, um, and, and maybe limited in their spatial resolution that you can get a lot of information, but only at a, at a very small um, spatial scale. And so the overall goal of our research is to develop methodology to utilize multi-beam sonar, back, multi sonar backscatter to discriminate between substrate um, native mussels and zebra mussels. And this is a collaborative project between myself, um, Jess Kozarek, I'm a research associate at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory at the University of Minnesota, um, and my colleagues at the University of Minnesota, Chris Millerin, um, Andy Riesgraf, um, and Naomi Blinick helped with our phase two. Um, researchers at McAllister College, Dan Hornbach, Kelly McGregor, and Mark Covey. Um, multi-beam sonar experts from the USGS Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center, um, Paul Grams, um, and our, his colleague, Matt Kaplinski, who's an independent contractor, also with a lot of experience in collecting and analyzing um, multi-beam sonar data. Um, and I need to acknowledge the input of um, our collaborator, Dan Buscom, who is really part of the vision of this project, um, although he, he will no longer be a part of phase three, but he still serves as a, a project advisor. So a large interdisciplinary project team to try to ask this, these questions. Um, just a really quick um, summary of, of how we got to phase three. Um, and so I really have to start with phase one. Um, and that is that, so with a multi-beam sonar, um, it's a, a, a research grade sonar piece of sonar equipment that gives you high resolution information on both um, uh, river or lake bed topography, so the depth as most sonar systems do, but also high resolution information on the backscatter. And the backscatter is really the way that um, sound is reflected um, off of a, a surface. Um, and so as you can imagine, a surface that has zebra mussels on it is much rougher than a surface that does not have zebra mussels on it. And so we're trying to exploit this roughness characteristic to help us identify mussel containing substrate. Um, acoustic backscatter from multi-beam sonar instrumentation has been used um, quite often in order to, um, to classify different types of substrate, like whether you're talking about sand, um, gravel, um, 
sand or gravel, for example. Um, and in the, if you have the presence of, of vegetation or, or not vegetation, um, but has not yet been used to try to quantify whether substrate contains um, mussels, either zebra mussels or native mussels. Um, so our phase one laboratory experiments were a proof of concept um, where we looked at a variety of acoustic settings in terms of frequency and pulse length in a controlled environment um, to, be, to see if we were able to discriminate between substrate that contains mussels um, and substrate that doesn't. We did this in experimental setup at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory um, and used our instrumentation carriage um, to move the multi-beam sonar instrument around. Um, and what this comes down to is, is uh, you know, we, we are collecting a lot of information on the acoustic backscatter and with these different pulse length and frequency combinations. Um, and from all of this information, we're compiling all this information together into a machine learning or a data-driven model that will then um, give us um, a function that describes the likelihood of a, of a specific substrate given um, the data. So with all of this data together, what is the likelihood that we have sand with high zebra muscle density, for example? Um, and the accuracy of, of the classification increases with more data sets. So in phase one, we were really able to show that we were able, using this acoustic backscatter information, to discriminate between our different types of uh, sediment or substrate um, and whether that sediment or substrate contained um, native mussels or zebra mussels. Um, but the accuracy of this classification increased with, with more information or more combinations of this um, pulse length and frequency settings on our multi-beam sonar. So we're currently um, working on phase two, which is the field validation. So taking these methods that we developed in the lab um, and taking into account field variability. So a greater range of muscle density, um, a greater range of different types of substrate and, and the presence of, of complicating factors such as vegetation. Um, again, verifying um, and, and refining our, our classification model so that um, we're able to um, uh, map zebra mussel density in the field. So phase three then, which is, is this continuation project that I'm um, presenting on right now, um, is taking this information that we've developed in phases one and phases two um, and doing a full scale classification and mapping. So rather than just looking at, at individual detailed locations, um, being able to map a large area of a, a lake and or a riverbed um, and map whether we have um, the different types of substrates that we have based on, on, on um, the acoustic backscatter information. So being able to map high, low, and medium muscle density in different types of substrate um, over a large area. Um, once we do this large scale mapping, then we'll go back and verify um, using our scuba diving teams um, that what we mapped is actually what it is. So we can do an analysis of the accuracy of our, our mapping and classification methods. Um, but the primary and overall goal of phase three is really taking this information that we learned in phases one and two and in the first half of phase three and translating the research into practice. So defining the limitations and challenges of our methods, um, specifically things like how do we deal with vegetation and what are the minimum densities that are detectable using this methodology, um, compiling this into guidance for field data collection, um, and compiling the documentation um, and the processing codes and procedures so that it's available for, for others um, who want to replicate these kinds of methods elsewhere um, to map um, invasive or, or native muscle um, populations. Um, and just taking this back, all three phases combined, what this means for management is that it makes it can make our monitoring efforts far more efficient. We can get a lot of information over a large spatial scale in a fairly efficient manner. Um, and one, one thing I forgot to mention about phase three, another component of phase three is going to be the, the cost um, and effort comparison between um, these methods and, and other methods, what are the advantages and disadvantages um, compared to more traditional surveying methodology? Um, 
so the, these procedures will allow us to make monitoring efforts far more efficient. They'll allow us to target management activities. So for example, in um, areas of very high zebra mussel density, um, and also allow us to map, map population changes um, over time. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about this next phase of our research. Thank you, Jess. I think we'll do questions at the end. And I think next, did we say uh, Shemek is going next? Yeah, I believe I am. Can you guys um, see my screen okay? Looks great. Okay, great. Well, hi everybody. I'm Shemek Bajer. I'm a research assistant professor at uh, Maserk. Um, I worked, worked there half time, and I'm also the owner of uh, Carp Solutions, which is a U of M startup that specializes in uh, developing new tools for common carp management. <clears throat> And today I'll be talking about a continuation of our work, uh, which focuses on acoustic conditioning in common carp to accelerate management and reduce costs. And this was this is a collaborative effort with Al Mansinger from uh, University of Minnesota Duluth, who is an expert on fish acoustics, and Rebecca Bullers, who will be the uh, the grad student on this project. This will start in in January. Uh, Brief introduction, common carp is a widespread invasive fish, very common in Minnesota, introduced over 100 years ago. I'm guessing you all probably know that already. And this fish can have really significant impacts on uh, the ecosystems. As you can see, it, it uh, disturbs uh, the sediments, uproots aquatic vegetation, and can, can reduce water clarity, uh, big impacts on biodiversity, uh, macrophytes, invertebrates, fish, waterfowl, and so on. Um, carp have uh, several unique behaviors that sort of allow us to develop new management strategies. They are, um, they are a social animal, um, which is key in this, in this um, project because um, um, we use sort of the concept of social learning in common carp. Uh, if some of the individuals in the population learn for example, there is a new source of food somewhere in the lake, other carp can learn from them and that causes uh, large feeding aggregations. Uh, long story short, uh, carp can be trained to aggregate in specific places in lakes using bait. And furthermore, um, bait can be selected, in this case it's cracked corn, to attract only carp and not the native fish. This is an underwater video of a carp feeding aggregation looks like. So these are carp feeding at a um, bag that is filled with cracked corn. This, this video was taken by Peter Hunt in our previous phase. Uh, you can see large numbers of carp and importantly, no native fish. So again, this is uh, quite selective. And we actually developed a new management tool using uh, th th these behaviors uh, where we set up nets in lakes and those nets are baited with cracked corn and then carp can be selectively removed. And 30 to 50% of populations can be removed in one season quite commonly. This is just one example or a photograph of what this process looks like we're looking at uh, carp being pulled out of the, the net onto a boat. Um, I want to show you what those nets look like. So we call them box nets. They are not too big, usually about 30 feet by 60 feet. They're set up in shallow water um, in lakes. Uh, you can see those metal pipes around the edges of the net. And those are used to lift the net up when the carp aggregate inside the net. And that process can happen uh, remotely. So <clears throat> this was taken uh, last month 
uh, there is a car uh, aggregation inside a net and the operator will lift the net using a remote controller in a second. So the weights that are sliding inside those uh, white PVC tubes drop down and the net goes up and uh, you can see the carp start jumping. So these, these fish are caught in the net and then the crew can move in and remove them. So typically several of those nets are installed around the lake and the removal process is repeated a few times uh, every summer. So there are several advantages, oops, um, meaning that we can attract large numbers of carp and the method is relatively easy to use. Uh, lake residents can be, can be engaged in this effort. They often go out and bait the nets uh, and it's so, uh, also species specific, but there are also some challenges which we identified in the previous phase. And I think the biggest one is that those feeding aggregations are not very synchronized. This is one example from uh, Lake uh, Taipo in Anoka County, where we are looking at the, uh, the unique number of carp that visit the bait per hour over about a week period. So we have dates on the bottom. And uh, so you can see that between zero and 20 carp visit the bait per hour on the left-hand side. And those blue numbers on top show how many carp visit that site per day. So for example, on September 9th, there were 33 carp that visited the site in that day, but there were only about 13 or so per hour. So clearly you can see that not all the carp visit the bait at the same time. And that's important because the way we catch them is the net comes up instantaneously. So we can only catch the carp that are at the bait at a given uh, time. So if we can synchronize aggregations, we can catch more carp. This is another exam example. Uh, from our phase two, we're sort of zooming in at a carp activity on the bait over a three hour period um, in the middle of July. And the numbers on the left hand side, those are all individual carp that have individually coded microchips. And um, you can see, if you see a lot of black dots on, on, on the screen, that means that the fish was on the bait pretty much continuously. Every few minutes it was detected. So you can see there's a couple of fish that are detected very often, uh, pretty much continuously. And there is some fish that are not, some carp that are detected only occasionally. The, the one on the, on the very bottom was only detected once. So this clearly shows that different carp have different, uh, behave differently at the bait. So again, if we could synchronize them, we could remove them faster. So that's where we thought about using acoustic conditioning to try and synchronize those feeding aggregations. Uh, the advantages of these methods are that uh, we could potentially synchronize feeding. We could attract carp from larger areas because sound travels far underwater. It has been shown to work in lab and pond settings. Uh, Al has showed that it does work in the pond with common carp. Um, carp are hearing specialists, meaning that they are suitable for this approach. And this is also easy to implement and save. So the experiments will be conducted in 2022 and 23. Those will be whole lake experiments. Uh, in, in those lakes, we'll tag hundreds of carp with microchips, as you can see on the uh, upper right photo. And we'll also establish baiting stations in those lakes. Each station will have an antenna for detecting the carp. We'll have a speaker and a feeder and where the debate is dispensed and there will be test and control sites so that we can test different hypotheses. And the first that we wanna test is do carp um, associate sound with bait? So that's sort of the most basic acoustic conditioning. This is through latency tests. So basically the way it works is first you condition them to associate food and sound and then you remove the food, you only play sound and see if they come back. Then we'll do a directionality tests to see if the carp can locate the source of sound in the lake. That's important because if you want to bring in more carp to the bait from larger areas, it's important to know how quickly they can localize the source of sound. And then the last one, we'll do whole um, population responses where we um, um, want to test whether the sites with acoustic cues attract more carp and whether the 
feeding aggregations that are more synchronized at sites where acoustic cue is used in combination with bait versus bait alone. So this is a, a lightning talk, so I wanted to keep it brief. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, we will be reporting in next showcase, uh, 2022, the results of the first field season. Uh, we will be also doing a carp workshop in, in association with this project. And, and Meg will be actually playing a key role in, the, in this, where we want to bring in all people interested in carp research and management, all stakeholders, uh, so that we can discuss you know, what we've learned and how this could be used. At this point, we're looking for study lakes. And this is Al, like I mentioned, from UMD. Um, he works on um, bioacoustics in fish. And this is Rebecca, who will be the grad student on the project. Thank you. All right, thank you, Shemek. It's really exciting. Um, and next we're gonna be hearing from Mike Smansky and looks like we should be well positioned for questions at the end. So I'll be sure if you do have questions, put them into the Q&A box. So thank you. Great, thanks, Meg. Uh, so again, my name is Mike Smansky uh, uh, and I'll be introducing our a lightning talk on our phase two project involving genetic biocontrol of common carp. So uh, don't pay too close of attention to the cartoon on this picture, which looks more like an Asian carp. This is another common carp project. Uh, and it's a common carp project that uses genetic engineering. Uh, genetic engineering has been uh, enabled in the past decade or so by a tremendous growth in tools available for precision manipulation of the genetic blueprints for an organism. Uh, and so these are, are rationally designed mutations. It's not random mutagenesis, but we're going in and specifically rewriting parts of an organism's genome to change its behavior. That enables a new class of technology for uh, invasive species control that together are called genetic biocontrol. In genetic biocontrol, essentially you convert a pest organism into a pesticide. So by rewriting the genome of the pest organism and re-releasing the genetically engineered organism uh, back into an infested body of water in this case, those genetically engineered organisms can spread either deleterious traits into the population or directly suppress population levels by doing things like, like mating with wild females and having none of the offspring survive. Uh, and so this is the type of technology that my group is working on in this MESERC funded project. Uh, some of the advantages to genetic biocontrol, and I'll say a lot of these advantages are theoretical, although genetic biocontrol has been field tested in some insects in the US and around the world. Uh, these are still new technologies and a lot more testing has to be done before they'd be used for invasive species control. But in theory, genetic biocontrol uh, is chemical free. That makes it more species specific because it spreads and decreases the population uh, by mating events between the genetic biocontrol agent and the wild type organisms. There is uh, less likely to be deleterious effect in, in native game fish or other flora and fauna. The genetic biocontrol agent isn't going to try to mate with a walleye or a muskie, right? It's going to mate with other carp, and that's how the deleterious genes are spread. Uh, the proofs of concept that have been demonstrated in laboratories for various organisms show that this can be effective and it can be scalable. <clears throat> As I mentioned, this is a continuation project. So uh, we had a two-year phase one project that wrapped up in 2020. Uh, and there's three different activities. In one activity, we did a, a fairly large public survey to track and, and gauge what the public thought about genetic biocontrol. Uh, we learned a lot, which I'm not going to go into detail on here, but I'll, I'll mention of the various biological control approaches, and those include genetic biocontrol, predator introduction, pathogen introduction. Genetic biocontrol uh, showed the most comfort level in the population, and we are going to uh, follow up on some of these studies in phase two. Uh, another thing we did in phase one was we we identified which genes in fish were suitable targets for genetic biocontrol. Um, so we have a number of gene targets that we've shown in the lab could work uh, to, 
to implement genetic biocontrol in carp or other invasive fish species. And the most important thing that we did in phase one was we established the ability in the MACER containment lab. And we have a video of this, uh, a lab tour video that you'll have access to. Uh, you, you've already had access to it throughout the day and, and maybe you will later in the day as well, where we have in the MACER containment lab, the ability to spawn carp year round, uh, which is really important because to do any genetic engineering, we need access to very early stage embryos. That's how we introduce the engineered DNA into carp. And so in phase one, not only did we establish year round carp spawning protocols, but we also demonstrated the ability to genetically engineer carp. And so that picture in the bottom right are carp expressing a green fluorescent protein from jellyfish uh, that we use as an as a easy reporter to measure the efficiency of genetic engineering in carp. So we're really excited to move into phase two now. Uh, and what we realized between phase one and phase two, in phase one, we were proposing a very specific type of genetic biocontrol that my group had developed uh, and invented. But we realized that with the ability to spawn carp year round and do carp transgenesis, that there are very few groups in the world that actually have these protocols at their uh, fingertips. And so in phase two, we're expanding our scope a little bit more and we're going to try to develop prototypes for a, a, an array of different genetic biocontrol strategies. Now there are about a dozen or so unique genetic biocontrol st strategies that work in different ways. Uh, some involve the release of sterile males, some involve the release of uh, carp that will distort the sex ratio, so the, the ratio of males to females in the native environment, eventually pushing it so far towards only males that the population can't sustain itself. And others, uh, will actually spread deleterious genes like wildfire through the, the carp population in a lake, eventually leading to its demise. And so uh, all of these different specific approaches have different strengths and weaknesses. And we're gonna use our, you know, leverage our capability to engineer carp uh, to take a number of shots on goal in the lab. There's no plan for any field trials or field release in this phase. Uh, the goal is just to engineer this in the lab so that these different approaches can be tested in the lab and we can understand uh, their efficacy and failure modes. And, and so as I mentioned, we're going to test sterile male approaches, sex ratio biasing approaches, and gene drive approaches. Uh, I just have this slide to demonstrate that a lot of these approaches there are groups working on them for different organisms around the world, insects, fish, mammals, and uh, some have been brought all the way to field trial. Uh, a lot have been brought to laboratory proof of concept. And our goal in this phase is to demonstrate uh, laboratory proof of concepts for a number of these approaches in common carp. Uh, we're also going to do a lot of stakeholder engagement to roadmap uh, the process from kind of where you plan out a new type of genetic biocontrol all the way to the point where it's implemented in, in lakes around the uh, world. We want to roadmap what we think that process will look like with a number of important stakeholders, including the local regulators, the DNR, uh, watershed district managers, tribal leaders. Uh, we want to engage federal stakeholders like uh, people who work at the EPA or the USDA uh, and technology developers as well, so that we can develop a, a shared language and, and a shared process for how to bring this type of technology to small field trials, large field trials, and eventually to uh, use in integrated pest management plans. And then the, the last aspect of our phase two work is a, an innovative strategy that we're collaborating with uh, John Biscoff's group in the University of Minnesota to accelerate genetic engineering of organisms like common carp that have long generation times. Uh, the, the fact that it takes an, an engineered carp roughly two years to reach sexual maturity to the point that you can spawn it out and, and uh, continue the genetic engineering process, that is a huge roadblock in, in developing this technology. So we have an approach to basically use fast developing fish as surrogate hosts for carp germ cells, the sperm and egg of engineered carp to allow us to convert an organism that has a two year generation period to one that has a four to six month generation period. And so we're excited to, to move forward on all those tasks. Uh, we're doing it in collaboration with uh, Shemek and John and a few others uh, around the country. And 
Uh, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I think we'll all turn our videos back on to take questions. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Really encouraging um, and exciting research. Um, looking forward to seeing where this goes. Um, Mike did mention the video. I just posted a link to it into the chat. Um, please be sure to check this out. This was something that they put together because um, Mike and his team were supposed to be part of the lab tour, but of course, that unfortunately had to be canceled because of our virtual format. So. Um, Mike and his team put together a really nice um, recorded tour of their lab and their operations. And uh, it's only 10 minutes, but it'll give you a great overview of how it's actually being done. So um, we'll go to the Q&A. So the first question is from Kevin. Hi, Kevin, great to see you on this. Um, the question is, there hasn't been any mention of the WAKE research in these presentations. Uh, Want to know what the status is and how this will be included in the future. So I will address one component and then I'm gonna turn it over to Jess, even though this is not her project. Um, she is uh, affiliated with that because this research is actually happening at the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. Um, but before I turn it over to Jess, I would just say that um, MACERC researchers have looked at wake boats um, specifically related to the risk of residual water in the ballast tanks. And what we found is that most of the tanks and the majority of models out there don't fully drain. And there's a substantial amount of water left over in those. And there's more than enough liquid to harbor zebra mussel villagers and likely other AIS. So um, as far as the vector, the science is in that they are a very high risk mode of um, recreation. And it's sort of up to uh, the regulatory agencies and policymakers at this point to deal with this problem. So. Um, but of course, the wave impacts is a whole other side of things, and hopefully Jess can give a, a quick update on that. Um, hi. Yeah, so unfortunately, I personally can't give an update on the, the WAKE project. Um, that project is being led by um, Jeff Marr at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. Um, and the, the project that he's working on is really dealing with um, the physics and, and impacts of, of the waves that are created by, um, by wake boats. Um, so that would be the appropriate contact to find out more information about the status of that project. Jess, do you have a sense of when preliminary results might be available or when they intend to submit for publication? Yep. Um, so as of right now, there was a, um, there's a draft report um, that's been compiled, compiled on preliminary results that were collected last year. Um, that's currently out for peer review. Um, and I'm not hundred, I'm not sure what the time frame is, but I, I expect that that will come back from peer review soon and then and then at that point be published. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have a question from Jeff about uh, the genetic biocontrol presentation. Uh, would you consider slash need to do physical removal and reproductive control? Um, he mentioned this because carp are long lived. And real quick before I turn it over to Mike, uh, Jeff, I really recommend that you tune into the carp panel following this session because we're definitely going to be digging into integrated approaches. So, but Mike, maybe you want to take this one. Yeah, so uh, we've done a, some modeling for how genetic biocontrol would work in an integrated pest management plan. And, and for it to work uh, the best possible way, you need to combine it with uh, physical removal. So we, we typically would model seining where 90% of the carp are removed uh, periodically throughout the control process. And, and that's, uh, I think, gonna be the best implementation where you combine something like Pshemix uh, box netting to remove as many of the carp as possible by physical methods. And then uh, that decreases the number of genetic biocontrol agents you would need to introduce to the lake um, to, to achieve, you know, we hope complete eradication, uh, but at least more substantial suppression of the population. Okay, great. And just to follow up, Mike, there is, we also discussed this option of actually using those genetically modified carp to prevent future invasions, right? In environments that don't have carp yet, or in cases where 
carp are eradicated, for example, using toxins or, or winter freeze outs. Yeah, so especially with the sterile male release approaches, um, you could think about using it prophylactically. So uh, the sterile males, if you're only releasing sterile males, they're not going to make more of themselves, right? So you don't need to worry about them replicating and expanding. And it's known that below a certain threshold, and Shemek knows the exact number, I think it's maybe 100 uh, kilograms per hectare of carp, they don't cause the environmental damage. And so you could, a, a lake that's at risk of being contaminated by wild type carp, uh, you could introduce a, a very small population of these sterile males. And the idea is that the first few females that go in there, uh, those sterile males will mate with the female and, and uh, none of the offspring will survive. And so it's a way to kind of uh, prevent, it, prevent the, the population from exploding in a lake. Um, so yeah, that, that is an application that we're considering. That's pretty exciting. Um, two, two quick things for Shemek. Um, you've got several offers here um, to work, work, work with you about potential study sites. There's something in the chat from Dwayne Anderson, um, a county commissioner. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And then in the Q&A, um, someone over at Keller Lake in Burnsville and Apple Valley with a goldfish problem. So something to think about. Maybe Shemek, if you could just put your email into the chat box so people know how to reach you. Yep, we'll do so, thanks. Okay, uh, question from Nicole. Uh, is there research being done on starry stonewort? Um, research is still ongoing, mostly in the Dan Larkin lab um, with his team. So we didn't get any um, proposals for starry stonewort this year. Um, COVID definitely impacted the number of proposals that we received. Um, and a lot of it too is just there's, um, the bench is only so deep for um, AIS experts in Minnesota and we've, we've tapped into most of the folks. So if there's any students out there listening uh, and wanna keep pursuing this, there's definitely a need for more AIS researchers. So. Um, yeah, no new Starry Stonewort projects, but just continuing Starry Trek and um, supporting Starry Stonewort managers out there. Uh, question from Scott. With the prophylactic approach, um, would you continually have to add the modified fish? Probably a question from Mike. Great question. And it relates back to the previous question that had a uh, part B about the longevity of carp. So common carp are quite long lived. Um, the, the idea is you would wanna keep a certain population number of the genetically modified carp to provide the prophylactic treatment. Uh, obviously if all the fish you put in die out, then there's gonna be nothing left to mate with the wild type females that, that enter that body of water. Uh, with Common carp, though, because they're so long lived, the frequency with which you'd have to restock it would be uh, pretty low. Okay. Um, oh, someone's got their hand up. We can try this. All right, Jessica Shaum, I'm going to click allow you to talk. So if you want to ask your question, I don't know if this will work or not. Um, don't hear you. Oh, that was a mistake. No problem. <laughs> okay, any other questions or researchers if you would like to ask questions amongst yourself? Uh, we have about seven more minutes. And no pressure though. <laughs> okay, I think I'll wrap this one up and um, for folks interested in the common carp issue, if you stick around um, in this webinar room um, at 3.15, we're gonna be doing a panel discussion with all of MACERC's um, common carp researchers and thinking about potential integrated pest management approaches for common carp. So if you stick around, this is what you have, otherwise you could bop into um, any of the other webinars. So thank you so much for coming. And thank you panelists, that was great. Thanks.